Hello everyone. Good evening and welcome to the very first session of the podium series Tech Talks by Asia Digital Labs. With this uh, all new series, we hope to shed some light on the technologies we use, the services we offer, along with a few success stories from each of our practices here at ADL. Uh, this month's Tech Talk is from the Data Analytics and AI practice. So a little bit about uh, Asia Digital Labs and what we do. Asia Digital Labs is the technology hub of the Asia Group in Malaysia and an innovative and service provider offering telcos focused digital and IT solutions that enable enterprises, individuals, and society as a whole. Our services range from IoT, cloud solutions, API management, and microservices, quality assurance, fintech platforms, UI UX consultancy, and much, much more. Uh, now, about our speaker for today. Representing the data analytics and AI practice here at ADL is Buddhika Gamage, a data science and engineering ar uh, architect for Asia Digital Labs who works closely with the Asia operators for solutioning machine learning and AI based big data applications for telco networks, marketing, and finance related domains. Holding a bachelor's degree in electronics and communication engineering and also a master's in business administration from the Australian Institute of Business and Master in Data Science from the University of Malaya. Here he is, he's also currently focused uh, towards de designing cloud ML and AI solutions. Buddhika, over to you. Hi, thank you so much, Nitish. Uh, so uh, I think we can start the session. So today uh, we'll be talking about uh, the AI uh, strategies, long range plans, and um, what are the design considerations and things you need to take into consideration while you crafting a strategy. Um, and in the second uh, half of this uh, webinar, we'll be talking about uh, AI and ML ops. There we'll be talking about the typical challenges, how it used to be before, and uh, uh, what we need to do and uh, what sort of framework we should have. Also about the life cycle, how it should be managed and the typical uh, MLOps architecture and also its benefits, right? Uh, throughout, I'll be giving a couple of examples of like how we have done and <clears throat> what sort of things you should have as well. Um, so uh, this is the agenda for today. So uh, let's start. So before I start the presentation, uh, I would like to uh, take a couple of minutes of like what uh, as ADL, what we uh, deliver uh, as a company. Um, so uh, it actually cut across all, almost everything which requires for digital transformation, things like uh, uh, Internet of Things, uh, then uh, cloud computing, um, uh, uh, like FinTech application development, um, BSS, OSS operation support, uh, FinTech platforms, telco solutions, managed services. Uh, and apart from everything, uh, we have also data science, analytics and AI uh, product spectrum introduced, uh, which would cater anything. So initially this was like designed to cater telco related solution, but uh, now we expand into a level that uh, <clears throat> would cater any enterprise. So today our focus also would be like how we can contribute to different companies in the industry uh, from uh, analytics and AI perspective and also machine learning perspective. Moving on. Uh, let's start the first session of this uh, webinar. Uh, so this I cover, I cover the AI strategy, long range plans for enterprises. Um, also, as I explained at the beginning, what, what, what sort of design considerations you should have, what sort of challenges you should face, uh, you would be facing as well, and uh, how you could overcome those things, right? So in very simple terms, let's, let's look at what is AI. So AI is like uh, uh, it's like machine learning you have already and on top of that automations. So a combination of these two would actually start creating closed loop systems. What we had before and also if uh, some of may be still not here. Uh, we, we are at the stage where we are having a lot of machine learning models, algorithms, use cases uh, prepared for different different business purposes, uh, different uh, objectives, right? If you're not here, then you are probably like 
uh, five to ten years uh, behind this game. So there is something that you should really start considering um, where you should be right now. So uh, so we are assuming you're already at this stage where you have already have machine learning models, right? So then we start to introduce all the automations which required to machine learning a machine learning model to start working on its own without any human intervention. That is the place where this general artificial intelligence comes in. So once you have these closed loop systems, you wouldn't need actually human interventions in the middle to make certain decisions. For example, earlier we, when we were operating on the machine learning models uh, to take key decisions, we, we, we needed to have human interventions and human um, uh, touch, right? So going forward, the expectation is an AI agent would work on its own without any human intervention. So that is the basis of AI. That is something, that is what we are trying to achieve. That is the basis for uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0. And it's also part of the uh, digital transformation as well. Right now we are, we every one of us going through. So let's look at what, what we should do at first, right? So this is not as easy as we think, right? So there are certain things that we should have it in place, considerations, before we uh, start implementing these AI models into operation and start uh, gaining revenues out of it. So one of the very first things that we should be focusing on, executing pilot projects. So uh, I have mentioned here that uh, without considering a return on investments at the beginning, because uh, you, you need to have pilot projects running at first, a uh, couple of machine learning models deployed to check whether the, you have the enough infrastructure uh, to go to a level of like AI automation. If not, what would happen if you're going to jump directly into an AI automation? You actually wouldn't know what sort of assessments you should have, what sort of things you'd in place, what sort of people you should have in your teams or in your organizations uh, to start uh, to go to that matured level of AI, right? Uh, the second thing, uh, provide required training for those who those selected candidates. So there are certain key stakeholders in these uh, AI strategies. So mainly on there is a huge role to be played by AI ML engineers. And also there are people who should be working on data science as data scientists uh, and also big business stakeholders. These business stakeholders are quite important because they need to understand what it is about. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be getting each and every solution uh, for each and every problem via AI or machine learning. So that basis you need to have, you need to understand what, what sort of problems you can actually solve uh, using uh, these machine learning and uh, AI platforms. Uh, so then once you identify these uh, candidates, these people, uh, you should start pushing them to uh, acquiring good uh, skill sets, uplift their skill sets and uh, prepare themselves to uh, cater these different different requirements. The third, I think the most important thing is this third point. Uh, based on my experience, you will definitely get stuck here. This is the place you will get stuck. Revise your entire technology stack. 90% of companies right now, especially big enterprises, they are running with legacy systems. We can't deny it. If you if you take a company like being like there for like 15, 20 years in the industry as an Enterprise entity, they, they have different different systems built uh, along the way uh, for different uh, requirements, right? So we need to understand what are these legacy systems and whether actually we can rely on these legacy system uh, going forward. And also quite important, how open these systems are. Let's say we have a couple of vendor specific systems. And if these systems are not open, for a machine learning engineer or AI engineer to come and create their own applications and start uh, you uh, integrate into those systems. If they are not open to them, then it's going to be a problem, right? Because we have models created, then we won't be having uh, a way to execute it. So that the, this is a place where you need to like have a real, uh, like a, a huge consideration here, and also what sort of things you you should do uh, to overcome it. 
um, so that's quite important. And you'll have a you have to spend like a huge budget there as well. Uh, so please uh, look into that as well. Um, then once you have these first key three points, you can start looking into uh, bringing all these blueprints, uh, then strategies, use cases, everything into a place where you can start talking to everybody uh, top to bottom um, and what sort of things we should be doing using AI and how we can start leveraging on these new technologies so we can get the maximum out of it. Then you start uh, talking about these things like uh, return on investments, growth hacking, everything comes to place. So nothing would be work without any return, right? So you need to start uh, considering at this point. The fifth point quite important as well. Invest on AIML engineers rather than data scientists. I know uh, right now we are in a state, most of the companies hunting for data scientists. So the place where people get wrong is so they, they, they start assuming that when you have a data scientist, that this guy is a superman and he can do everything. No, that's not going to work. That is, a, that is the second most place most of the people get stuck. So it's actually like uh, uh, linking back to the second problem as well. Um, we know there are people coming from statistics backgrounds, uh, different uh, computer science backgrounds, um, and uh, how we can start uh, employing them uh, with engineering skills if, if they lack any engineering skills, right? So that's quite important. That's why the training process is quite important here as well. Uh, yeah, so moving on. Um, here I would like to talk a little bit about what are the baseline requirements that we should be considering when it comes to AI strategy. There are six key uh, points I'm going to discuss here. Uh, let's uh, go by one by one. Performance. So this performance we're talking about is the performance of, of your existing machine learning models. Whether they are up to your standard, whether they are up to a standard where you can actually start deploying it in an uh, existing operational system and uh, start uh, uh, ex uh, uh, accepting a, a return on that, right? So let's say that uh, there are a couple of like the key uh, parameters we should be looking at. I'm not going to talk those in detail here, but I have mentioned it here, you can read it out. And um, for example, let's say you have a prediction model which have as an accuracy of 40 to 50%. Uh, then you should start realizing whether this 40% or 50% accuracy is actually good enough for your business, for the business you are going to create these machine learning pro, uh, algorithms, whether they are good enough to create and uh, return on that. Right? So that's quite important. So, so this, is, this is the place where the ML engineers, uh, data scientists come together and like start improving these uh, performances of the model. So that is a key, key concern. Without having um, performing models, you will never be able to gain anything out of it. Then comes the uh, uh, most discussed uh, topic, I believe, in uh, this era, like 2021, 20, 2022, privacy, regulatory, and compliance. Since companies are coming into a maturity level in different different organizations, also they are they start looking into how we can leverage on personally identifiable information. In Sri Lanka also recently, um, they introduced Data Protection Act. There will be a lot of changes coming along with that. And how we can start working on this personally identifiable huge data. If you take FMCG, for example, you will be having customers of millions of records, right? Including their personal information, mobile numbers, their addresses, their NIC numbers, and for machine learning and AI problems, how are we going to use this? Even are we allowed to use it? And if you're going to use it, are we going to use it only for the benefit of the company? Or are we going to use it for the benefit of the uh, customer as well? Where we should be having the balance? So the, this is like one of the uh, major design con considerations right now um, when you're designing an uh, AI strategy. Then scalability. So AI, when, you, when you're going to create a strong AI model, right? more the data you have, more accurate the solution would be. So maybe you are building a model with 100,000, 200,000, or 300,000 uh, data samples. 
but in the real operation, you might need to deal with millions of records. So previously we had legacy systems. Also, we didn't have the privilege of using cloud services to scale. But we had we had to probably, let's say you have a model and you need to scale that model to, to cater millions of records. You would probably need to wait one year or six months or one year time to increase your Hadoop cluster so that it can start uh, catering your model. But going forward, we have the luxury of start using machine learning models on cloud services. So that will allow us to use uh, scalable, uh, use, uh, scalable uh, uh, systems. Um, and uh, that is a leverage we would be having and it's good to have. And uh, the smart way of doing it is like how and how are we going to optimize the cost while operating in the cloud? Uh, so we get the maximum return out of it. So the, the design consideration here is uh, leveraging on the cloud at the same time, or probably maybe like multiple clouds to say Google, AWS, Azure, uh, and which services we should be using from each and every public cloud solution, service provider, and when, and for how long. So that is the key concern here. Moving on. Stability. Now we have models created, ready to deploy, and it's already deployed, let's say, and how stable they are. So this is the place where the ML ops, AI ops, which I'm going to discuss very in detail in the latter part, comes into place. So we have to make sure whichever the model we deploy, it's running stably. So there we need will probably will need to consider about data rifts model rips, and how are we going to monitor these things? I'll be talking a little detail on during the architecture design of uh, the AI ML ops on the stability part. It's quite important as well. Then the maintainability. So the uh, CI CD part of the machine learning operation or AI operation comes into place with the maintainability. You have an operating model. What sort of changes you can introduce while the model is operating? without interrupting. If you have a model right now and it's creating, let's say 10, 20 million per day, if you're going to interrupt that model per day, you can imagine the loss you're going to make, right? So how we can stop that interruption and while operating, how we can start applying these changes is the, the, the next actually biggest consideration, right? So that's why we need to have the ML ops in place as well. Uh, when it comes to security, so, Again, it's like lying back to uh, uh, cloud services as well. So because most of us, we are going to operate in, in cloud environments uh, going forward. So when it was operating in on-prem situations, we actually had like pretty good uh, security um, covering our, all our models, right? Because it was operating uh, in a closed uh, private cloud. But now we are going into the cloud to a public cloud. So the biggest threat in public cloud, a public cloud can be open to internet at any time. So anybody can, uh, there may be a risk of like uh, uh, intruders, uh, people uh, uh, start to like hack. So we'll have to be really careful uh, while we are designing a craft or AI strategy uh, because this is one of the least uh, considered uh, points uh, most of the people forget about security. They just see a service. They just see, okay, this is a solution. They just start deploying it, but they really don't care about how the data is moved, how the data is like treated at rest, how the data is being treated on the move. So this is quite important as well. All right, moving on. Um, so I'm introducing here a um, couple of verticals any enterprise could have and some of the use cases could summarize. I'm, I'm not going to discuss detail each and every use case, but I'll pick a couple of use cases from each and every vertical and uh, try to explain to you uh, how, uh, how, how it might uh, um, uh, start uh, uh, helping your enterprise, right? So let's start from the marketing 
And uh, so some of these actually uh, uh, pillars can be um, interrelated based on the way you define your business. For example, in some companies, uh, they have they don't have something called digital services, but they consider everything into fintech. But some companies, they have fintech, they have digital services. Uh, when it comes to telco companies, they have networks separately in most of the cases and IT separately. But in some of the other companies, you might have this network and IT together where the telco network part is not relevant to them, but IT and ICT is quite important for them. And uh, custom experience management, marketing and business operation, supply chain management, these three are, I would say, for a consumer company, consumer-based company, it would be quite important, right? So I'll, I'll take one, one use case by uh, from marketing and <clears throat> business operation. One is like dynamic pricing enablement. So uh, some, something you could do with uh, AI is like a dynamic uh, pricing enablement. You can start uh, leveraging on um, uh, machine learning and also some of the AI techniques to create dynamic pricing based on certain certain factors. For example, let's say right now, if you take majority of the businesses, they wouldn't be having dynamic pricing based on the demand except for airline uh, ticket pricing and all. But uh, if you take a FMCG or something, but you wouldn't you wouldn't see that dynamic pricing uh, happening very frequently. Even in the telco industry, you wouldn't see that much, right? So it would be quite important how we could start giving dynamic pricing for the consumer um, and it also could be beneficial for both the, for the customer as well as for the company. So that is one of the uh, best use cases I would say. Then I would take um, uh, this uh, custom experience agents which would cater both business operation as well as customer experience management and uh, let I have a video for you and uh, there also I'll be discussing in little detail there. But uh, here, let's say that you have a custom experience. You have a place where you need to actually put a custom experience center. That cost may be, let's say, like uh, 20 million. But probably within introducing of an AI agent for 10 to one, uh, one or 2 million rupees uh, in Sri Lankan rupees, if I say. Uh, so you would actually probably be, be able to deploy uh, five or six employees work into that uh, specific AI agent where you, the, that agent would be able to start communicating with the customers, understand the customers, understand the language of the customers, uh, maybe what exactly the requirement and direct it to the uh, right place or maybe give a solution at the same place, right? So that is the idea. So what happens there, it improves your business operation in a way and also uh, it satisfies your customer experience, customers, customer, uh, experience as well because previously maybe that customer had to wait for like two days three days to get a solution but now you have these uh, ai agents working uh, so they, they they'll start uh, giving solution um, on demand at, uh, on the spot and um, next space uh, actions and operations so if you take uh, uh, a company uh, like an e-commerce company where uh, you might have seen already like companies like Netflix, then eBay, uh, eBay Amazon. Uh, uh, for example, Netflix, what, what they do, uh, they, once you start subscribing, they get your preferences. So along the way, when you start uh, watching your movies or TV series, based on your preferences and your historical behavior of watching movies and TVs, they'll start recommending you more relevant, um, uh, I would say products or movies. So, TV series uh, for you. Similarly, um, we can deploy the same concepts into our general businesses when you have multiple products. Uh, based on this customer's historical behavior, we can start recommending um, different different products uh, uh, for, the, for the benefit of the customer. And um, uh, uh, that will be like, uh, that will be the next level of your business operation. Uh, moving on to this fintech and digital services, I'll uh, pick one or two uh, use cases from here as well. <clears throat> one of the uh, use cases I would like to uh, take here is um, a digital way. We all have uh, most of the companies uh, when you cater in the consumers, we have applications, right? So imagine an app which would cater multiple requirements at the same time. 
Uh, let's say that uh, XYZ company, e-commerce company, uh, for example, which I explained before. And um, imagine this, uh, these customers uh, want to go for a dinner after work. Uh, but but, but us in, in usual scenarios, what happens is, so that customer would actually will have to use a couple of other applications to check what are the best places that you can have your preferences and what are the most closest to your place that you could have that preference. Likewise, imagine all these um, these new features are embedded into one application using AI, taking your location, analyze your location, predicting your locations, and uh, knowing your preferences based on your previous searches. Uh, so if, if they can start uh, creating things like uh, smart uh, <coughs> maps uh, based on your location, so they can maneuver you to where, wherever you want. Right. So that actually will enable uh, the customers uh, to use the same application without going back and forth uh, uh, between multiple uh, applications. So these are some of the use cases actually you can start deploying in your fintech uh, business as well as digital services business. I have mentioned other use cases as well here. So the network um, pillar is actually, this is uh, quite uh, unique for telco um, use cases. Uh, I wouldn't go very detailed there. Uh, so when you have multiple networks, how you can start <coughs> planning, optimizing these networks using machine learning and AI, what are the uh, latest technologies, I mean AI technologies that you can use, then how you can manage things like load balancing, how you can start uh, uh, looking into uh, license management using AI, and how you can start predicting for your forecasts, quite important, one of my favorite areas as well. And uh, when it comes to IT especially, so as I explained before, uh, during this like regulatory session, uh, so identifying PII information for a, for a particular enterprise would be quite important. So those things can actually be done using uh, this AI and machine learning uh, techniques. And also similar to network, if you consider network and IT as one entity, so these all these like use cases I explained before, like uh, load balancing, license management also applies to IT as well. ICT, uh, going to ICT, um, let's say you are a company which owns data, how you can start leveraging on uh, data monetization, right? And also, let's say you are a company who, you, who has data as well as you have a strong suit of uh, machine learning as well, right? Then how you can start uh, creating uh, services like uh, platform as a service, AI platform as a service. Uh, this is one of the uh, strongest uh, products we are working on these days. Um, and um, software as a service for AI, uh, things like uh, Jupyter, Jupyter Labs, how you can start leveraging on these open source uh, products in an enterprise to uh, give it to users to a lower price compared to the key um, public cloud offering guys. I know. Uh, supply chain management, uh, important for almost all the businesses. So uh, uh, supply the, the robotics also uh, play, play a huge the role here. Um, company like Amazon, uh, they start uh, using uh, these uh, uh, robots to manage their um, supply chains, reduce the lead time to a certain level, and uh, start deploying actually at the same time these people who've been working on these manual work into something more important, right? So actually, the Key consideration is that so if you look at all 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 these use cases, each and every use use case is giving a solution to a problem you have. These are not good to have, right? Going forward, so this is a, like a, I would say a taxonomy I would uh, give for an enterprise where you can start leveraging on these use cases, start using it, and um, you will have amazing results. But only if you plan and strategize your uh, thinking and also execution properly. I have a small video, uh, so let's let's uh, have a look at that first.
Say hello to Pepper. Pepper is high tech, low maintenance, and not your typical robot. Pepper's not here to replace humans or even vacuum the floor. Pepper is here to make people happy, help them grow, and enhance their lives. Think of it as high tech. You can high five. Awesome. Pepper can be incredibly helpful interacting with customers and solving problems or providing information. That's because Pepper is a friend, an advisor, and a business partner. In fact, there's only one thing Pepper isn't a finished product. And that's where you come in. By creating new content and new usages, developers just like you will progressively advance Pepper's growth. And you'll quickly discover that not only do Pepper's SDKs make it easy to jump right in, but this is also unlike anything else you've ever worked on. Because now, your ideas truly do come to life. So, what do you say? Want a challenge? Want to make the world a better place? Want to just hack into something really freaking cool with endless possibilities? Then we want you. Pepper's SDK comes with access to a smart, passionate, vibrant community with tons of development support. So join the movement to enhance and elevate Pepper, the emotional humanoid robot built to benefit mankind. Oh, and remember, it's not just a robot, it's Pepper. This is Pepper today. Where will you take Pepper tomorrow? Visit developer.softbankrobotics.com. Yeah. So similar to Pepper, there are a lot of like this is actually you would say it's a it's a platform you can start leveraging and start using. Um, as I explained before, during uh, those use cases, custom experience management, um, and the, these are the agents that we want to see. Uh, right now, how we can improve our businesses using these sort of agents, right? Uh, so uh, I'm going to start like explaining the AI reference architecture, and also I would take uh, Pepper as an example uh, to how we can use uh, this reference architecture to build a custom experience agent like Pepper, right? Uh, so this is also uh, the reference architecture uh, proposed by Asiata. Um, so when you look at this reference architecture, there are a couple of uh, segments: infuse, analyze, organize, collect. Right. So this covers entire li entire life, life cycle of uh, building an AI agent. Let's say this is the place where we want to deploy uh, Pepper, right? Customer service uh, as a customer service agent. So where do we have this data? We have this data of previous uh, customer, customers visiting, customer purchases, uh, uh, customers other details, what sort of things they've been doing. Um, and we have all this information here at the edge services, right? So we have also a problem to solve. The problem is, the objective is, we have a platform like Pepper. We need to build AI solutions, models to be deployed into Pepper. This is the place where we build the models. And let's say we also need things like speech to uh, text uh, uh, conversions, speech recognitions. Then we can start leveraging on um, public cloud services like Google, AWS, Azure. They already have those services. Or even if you want to build that from the stretch, you can do it here. Right. And to do that, we need to take the data from here. So we have this data collected here at the edge services also. And this data is coming to our data warehouses. At the same time, the key consideration that we discussed before, governing the data. So we actually don't need to know whether this customer is uh, A or B or C. But what we need to know is a customer we have, and we have this set of attributes. So that is, this is a place that anonymization, pseudonymization would happen. We, the a machine learning engineer, or an AI uh, engineer or a data scientist would need to know what sort of uh, the who who the customer is. But what what we're looking at is set of attributes that we can start looking into to to create the model. So there is a governing governing body, uh, which is also connected to the uh, the uh, development team. Uh, so and also what 
what sort of data is being exposed to the development team as well. So once the, this model is built, right? So that, that it could be a, like a machine learning model, or it could be a set of models built to cater different, different, different uh, solutions that we want to deploy in Pepper. So one of them could be uh, vision, like how whether this this robot can have a uh, it's obviously having a camera and whether they, they can detect this customer, right? And identify the customer. So we have a previously tagged data, um, a label data, and uh, so I'm coming into the um, customer experience center so that they would be able to, uh, the paper would be able to under, understand that that's me. And uh, okay, and once they identify the customer, then I'm, I'm going to start to have a conversation with the robot. So for that, uh, so the probably the the robot will need to have uh, speech recognition, understand the language I'm I'm speaking, what sort of dialect I have, what sort of questions I'm asking in an intelligent manner, right? So similar to this, there we can start deploying uh, multiple number of uh, use cases um, to be deployed into this, right? Uh, so. There is a key key component here as well. Before we start deploying it, those model links to paper, we also need to <clears throat> analyze and identify the use case that we are going to deploy in paper, whether actually it's worth of doing it. Right. So that, that is, this is a place where that happens, where the data analysts, business analysts, the translators comes into the picture and they continuously checking with the business operation guys with the deploying certain use cases to paper is actually going to work or not. That continuous process should have. Once it is verified, then the engineers can start deploying the models and uh, start monitoring uh, paper, how, uh, how whether they are drifting based on the inputs they take and also the feedback they get it from the customers, whether actually this works. So in a very high level, this is the way you should start <clears throat> using and leveraging on this architecture to create a AI agent like Pepper. So moving on, so I'm going to start the second session of uh, the presentation, uh, which contains the uh, DevOps and um, DevOps part of machine learning and AI, which we also called uh, AI and ML ops. Uh, We'll be taking the questions later for the both the sections, so uh, please bear with me. So let's see what um, what has been there before, right? What sort of challenges we had, um, and why actually we need uh, ML and AI ops into our general operation, into our enterprises. Uh, we had two main uh, analytical uh, operation systems, I would say, mainly. One is the data mining operation. When you have a certain business problem to solve, uh, a business person comes with a problem and we give a rule uh, based system, probably, uh, taking the data into consideration where we had uh, these big, huge data warehouses and it would probably take a while, but um, that actually would give a, a level of good uh, analytics to understand and uh, run the business for the business owner. Right? Uh, there's nothing wrong with this system. Uh, it, it works for a certain uh, problems. It would give certain solutions as well. But we start uh, uh, the key consider the key problem we had during this time when this was operating was we didn't have enough probably resources even our laptops were not not strong enough to do what we are doing right now we didn't have uh, enough resources enough IT resources to start working on AI and all but it, AI was there at that time machine learning was also there but it wasn't introduced to general business then we started looking into machine learning models. Right, with the advancement of technologies, uh, processors, <clears throat> different different uh, companies, Nvidia and all these AMD 
Intel, they all, all started producing high capacity processors where it would cater to multiple um, computation problems um, with a considerable good amount of time, right? That's good, actually. The, the resources are not bad, uh, not as good as the cloud resources we are getting right now, but it was not bad, right? So data scientists had ML models de developed, trained, but the problem here was the deployment team is a completely different uh, set of people, probably coming from IT. They don't have actually a proper uh, detailed understanding of what was the business problem, <clears throat> what was the objective. They are, their main purpose is come here and just like do the deployment. And if you don't have enough resources, we'll probably have, we'll have to wait for five to six months to uh, get the model uh, developed by the data scientist to be deployed. And that is also not going to work because this, this, this is something that uh, needs to go in hand in hand. You can't have different two processes here. One set of people developing model, one set of people deploying the model, and there is a disconnect. So because of this, imagine that you have a business problem today, and if you're going to deploy a model after six months, that business problem actually might not even valid anymore, right? So it's not gonna work, right? So for a, for a, for a fast moving business, for a fast moving enterprise, it's not gonna work. That is the place where we wanted to, uh, everybody started realizing and start uh, uh, agreeing to AIN ML lifecycle. <clears throat> which mainly has key um, parts, research, development, operation, and decommission. Um, most of the people forget about the decommissioning part these days. They are mainly con uh, thinking up to operationalize part, but the decommissioning part is also quite important. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about this. So whenever we have a business problem here coming in, uh, our ML engineers, AI, engineers or data scientists have to start doing the research for that particular problem. Start looking into different papers, start looking into articles, uh, what the other companies have done, like a lot of research, a lot of research. So based on that research, then we come to a realization, okay, I, for this problem, we can actually give this solution. There is this method that we wanted to, uh, we can deploy to this problem. Then the problem comes whether we have enough data, <clears throat> right? Then it's, we, we need to go in this cycle here first, to understand that. So that is actually something we used to do before also. Still, it, it continues. There's no change to that. Then once this model is built, then we start, we need to start deploying. So that is the place where ML ops going to work and AI ops also going to work. Um, ML engineers start working with data scientists. Uh, and also machine learning engineers as well, data engineers as well. In the architecture, I'll, I'll explain why. But uh, the key, key point here is they are not uh, individuals who should be working in silos. And it's only a role. The most productive way of doing it is shared knowledge and using the same um, individual for data engineering, machine learning, uh, as a machine learning engineer, as an AI engineer, as well as a data scientist. So when it comes to this life cycle, everybody knows what's going on. There's no discontinuation. So the people, the person actually been developing the model, uh, maybe two months ago, now that person is working as an ML engineer. And that person knows actually what is there. There's no discontinuation. And because of this, the process becomes smoother and there's no discontinue and you don't need to wait. So the ML engineer also knows what sort of resources you need to know, you need to have, what sort of capacity you need to have and how long it takes to run the model and how long it will take to, in, in, uh, um, to, in, uh, uh, to start deploying it. Likewise, at the same time, as I explained before, without interrupting, the operationalized model, we can start 
injecting changes. That is the most important thing. We are not going to sub the model while operating. All the changes are going to be applied. Right. At the same time, once it's operationalized, uh, these models will start with the uh, will be monitoring, and um, so we will know whether this the, the the objective of the model, the initial model, whether that objective is diverted or not after a while. So if we we, we see a deviation, a data drift, or a model drift. Then we start creating alerts to the data science teams okay, and start uh, telling that we need to retrain the model and we need to uh, maybe even uh, look at to start looking into a new model soon. <clears throat> and once we have a confirmation that this is not no longer going to cater the initial problem we had, then it's going to end production archive after decommission. The good thing about the decommissioning part is we are not going to entirely forget about the model. That model can be reutilized again to a different problem in a different business domain as well, because uh, it's already there in the archive. We are not, even though we decommission it, it will be there in an archive, right? Maybe. Uh, so one of the experience we had also during the last two years is the pandemic situation, right? During the pandemic, when it was started, the entire um, nature of customers actually start changing. So. The models we build uh, was available and operationalized during that time was no longer valid. We, we started looking, seeing that the model performances are degrading. So that is the place where it's quite important. If you don't have the proper monitoring mechanisms in place, and we wouldn't know that uh, these models are actually degrading, we need to start looking into different solutions. Quite important because once this is operationalized, it's the money that we are spending on these models to be operated. And this also may be probably be in a cloud, solo, uh, cloud service operating and um, nothing is cheaper anymore. You'll have resources, but it's not cheap, right? So this is the, uh, this is the ML yeah, life cycle. And uh, so this is a recurring. Everything is recurring. Uh, that is also one of the reasons why we start uh, um, adapting to Agile Manifesto. How, uh, in a given shorter times, how we can understand the business requirement faster, change it according our models also according to their business requirement changes and uh, replicating and uh, reflecting those changes into business operation with the help of AI and ML. Moving on. Um, this is a uh, high level architecture, um, a general architecture we would uh, propose to any enterprise uh, to be used for AI and AI machine, AI, AI and ML ops. So this actually contains uh, three key uh, areas, data lake management, research and development, ML operation. So uh, if I go back uh, to this reference architecture, this is the place we are talking about. This place. It's here. That's why you would see the other business stakeholders here. This is entirely how you are supposed to place your technical staff in AI and ML. Data lake management, the most important part. Without data, you can't do anything. If you don't have data, then uh, there's no point of even talking about machine learning. So it's uh, everything about data. You need to have the best practices uh, to manage your data lake. I mentioned data lake here because uh, the data warehouse is not, uh, no, not no, no, no longer valid uh, terminology for me and for most of the uh, uh, people who are working in AI because it may con contains different types of data, not only structured data, probably unstructured data as well. And we should have the right tools and capabilities to get this data into a research and development pipeline. These people, data engineers, data scientists, machine learning engineers, and also you can call him an AI engineer as well, not a problem. Um, they, are, they, they are roles, right, as I explained before. So what should happen from the people management part, the, 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 those individuals who are assigned to the pool of 
resources they should start changing their job scope time to time so they know what's going on in each and every section to walk you through a little on this process it's a recurring process so once you get a business requirement from here a data scientist would start looking into the problems as i explained before and they start training model validating models testing models uh, the validated models will the best performing models will go to a model repository right so what the machine learning engineer would do he will pick the best performing model and he will start creating a release pipeline package the model and uh, release the application uh, based on the performances if the performance is degraded will be seen from the monitoring uh, uh, side of the ml uh, ml uh, operations and it will be notified to the data science team again and whatever we run using here it will be again feedback to the data lake so that that feedback uh, loop is also quite important uh, that will enrich the models as uh, in a way that we get the data uh, from the feedback for example let's say we have a recommender engine running and when we get the feedback of the customers and when once you start using it as a feature to the model that will further improve our model so in a very high level this is the uh, architecture we would uh, like to propose uh, for an aiml ops so let me talk a little bit about uh, the benefits and also this is the last slide uh, of the uh, presentation um, reproducibility and uh, auditable uh, what this means is uh, so each and every AI and ml system running has an investors right so they need to know what's going on what's been done, uh, the people are doing with the money they are investing so auditing is quite important even in AI and ml these things might not be yet introduced to most of this is uh, people who are working but it's going to be your system is going to be audited your ai model is going to be audited in a very detailed level you need to have logs maintained so these frameworks will give you a way to properly monitor and also keep a track on what's going on what went wrong right so we start learning what what went wrong and we start uh, preparing that uh, our entire framework so that won't happen again quite important right and also as i explained the decommission part during the ml uh, life cycle whichever is going to the uh, uh, to an uh, decommission um, way so it can be actually used as a reproducible model because it's been already been used for a different purpose that same purpose might also come in a different uh, business unit or something like that validation so this enables you to do uh, unit unit testing testings uh, and also um, uh, enabling this data science domain to be software based practices that is also something uh, we we don't do much it's not that we 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 can't operate without software based best practices but when you have the those software based practices in our framework um, it will reduce the number of uh, errors it will it will it will it will give us a level of confidence that this is actually operating in a world class class manner right so that is also so important uh, they are also it will help us to reduce the biasness and also uh, improve the ex explainability of the models in different ways automation and observability um, so as you can see there will be a lot of automations a lot of manual works being done in between they are going to be automated people will be responsible this for these uh, processes and it will enable us to start monitoring these uh, processes and models so we make sure everything is running in a very smooth manner people this will introduce uh, transformation to the organizations who are adopting to it there will be new jobs created for people there will be knowledge enhancements it will lift entire your entire thinking of how you should be start looking into problems those people who have been doing manual work from 8 to 5 example banking those people who are sitting in the front desk and doing every day the same thing that will be taken over by an robot probably 
right? Because it's it's the same thing that you have to do every day, and those people actually can uh, start working on something more important, where you can start creating value for the company you are working. That's the whole idea about it, and also it's very important to keep in mind these new technologies come into place not to replace humans. They will improve the way we work, uh, and it will. Uh, also improve the entire process of the way we think and the way we work. And once we understand it, it will bring us to a different level. Maybe even it will reduce the, reduce the number of hours we need to work so we can spend more time with our family, right? Process. So obviously, as you can see, uh, being explaining this, uh, the process will be improved. All, uh, um, I mean, from each and every uh, step, uh, the, there will be process improvements, right? Um, uh, platform. Uh, time back to reduce, I mean, removing these legacy systems, introducing new technologies, new platforms, new types of integrations, along with AI and ML. Um, it will Im improve the entire platform we have in our enterprise. Yeah, so with that, um, it comes to an end before we finish the presentation. I have another small video I, I just want you to look at. Have you ever wondered how humans and robots work together at Amazon? From the moment a product enters our fulfillment center until it heads out to a customer, Amazon technology helps our associates in so many incredible ways. Amazon introduced our drive unit robots in 2012, which led to 300,000 new full-time jobs. These are the stow stations. They use artificial intelligence and computer vision. Yeah, pretty cool. This is the palletizer. It uses computer vision to stack totes of products. There's so much cool technology that goes into this. Oh yeah? Like what? Well, like 2D imaging, a laser sensor, high motion performance, and 165 kilogram load capacity. Wow, amazing. Our tech vests help communicate with the robots to keep us safe while working on the field. I think your tech vest could use a little more tech. Thanks, but I think my vest already has everything it needs. Incredible. I know, right? With Amazon's human and robotic powers combined, we are building the future of technology together. Yeah, so uh, you see like, uh, so so Amazon has come to this point. Uh, probably they've been working a lot with these technologies and um, how they've been adapting to these new technologies. So this is the result of it, right? So it's not a, like a two weeks, three weeks, or two months or three months work. You need to adapt to it. Uh, you need to start working on it and have a proper plan. What are you going to achieve after two years, maybe three years? Maybe after four years, everything would change, right? So I would say like start creating short term plans and take into these design considerations I gave before. And um, so I think if you go there, so then uh, then we can start looking into what actually we can uh, uh, start taking into our businesses uh, to further improve the way we work and way we think. Uh, so a couple of references I would like to suggest, like um, one thing uh, from AWS, data science on AWS, this is where Chris Fregley, um, and uh, artificial intelligence, a modern approach by Stuart Russell, Peter Novi. And also data science on Google Cloud Platform by uh, Malia Lakshman. Uh, also, they have uh, a lot of uh, like uh, uh, open source um, videos that you can refer to. Some of uh, Lakshman's uh, videos are also available in uh, Coursera if you follow. And uh, so, so good thing about like uh, reading these books is like it will give you a complete understanding of I mean um, uh, how it works especially in the cloud solutions, cloud services. And also this book will give you a, like a very good detailed understanding of uh, how artificial intelligence should be a, a part of our general life and also to our business processes. Uh, with that, uh, it comes to an uh, uh, end of uh, my uh, webinar on um, uh, artificial intelligence strategy and also how we can start uh, working on the operations of it. Uh, thank you so much for uh, bearing with me during this one hour. Um, yeah, you can reach out to me uh, uh, via my LinkedIn, also via my email. 
any any time you want. Thank you so much, um, uh, Nitish. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can take it. Thank you for the knowledge of the insightful session on AI. Uh, we had a question from Sava, but he had raised his hand, but he has logged off. Uh, uh, logged off from the webinar. Uh, if anyone else have any questions uh, regarding the webinar or technology, digital transformation, AI, uh, free to ask anything. Here. Bigger, shall we? Was it talking? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for being a part of this and uh, have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Good weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye.